Okay, so preview this one. And then that's it. Okay. Yeah. So we are going to do chapter two in history, class ten nationalism in India. <coughs> so uh, chapter one was nationalism in Europe. How yeah. did nationalism, uh, you know, happen or develop in Europe? Yes. So we saw that nationalism was earlier they had dynasties with multiple territories and there was a king in Europe but then gradually uh, people realized that they were being exploited by these kings and dynasties and rulers and they revolted the French Revolution uh, was the most important and then um, uh, you know uh, those dynasties were brought down and a nation state uh, happened, came into existence which means that uh, um, you know representatives of the citizens were the rulers there was not one ruler or a set of rulers but the people the citizens they started um, kind of ruling so they were uh, chosen by the people and uh, the things started getting better because in the dynasty uh, rule uh, people were uh, exploited yes they had to pay taxes they had to work for free and they were like slaves but uh, uh, when na the nation state came into existence they got some power and they they could elect their own leaders and they could um, you know choose their uh, rulers yes. similarly in India uh, we will see here that nationalism in India also started with something similar which means that people were ruled by the Britishers the colonial power and uh, because their condition was very you know uh, pathetic and Excellent. yeah no, they, um, they, they did not have enough money they did not have enough food and they were being exploited by the uh, British government so they all started to realize that they had to oppose the British government and their struggle together uh, as one force against the Britishers, against the colonial powers, gave them a sense of belonging. In, in European nationalism also we saw yes. that uh, uh, the, the, the sense of having a common um, history, common language, common culture, not, not only really. this but fighting together for your rights and uh, sacrificing for your rights and uh, 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 you know having the intention of sacrificing more in the future for the betterment of the nation that it gave a nation. sense of belonging to people yes. that yes. concept came to be known as nationalism, nationalism. so here Swaraj uh, which means that Swa is our uh, Raj is rule yes, yes. self-government our, our government this concept of fighting against the Britishers and getting Swaraj gave a sense of belonging one kind of commonness between people yes who were from different different areas india is a big country india has a very diverse population yes they had different languages different cultures but this one thing that everyone was being exploited by the colonial powers and everyone decided that they are going to uh, be uh, fighting so that gave the sense of nationalism and sense of uh, belonging to people and that's what uh, started nationalism in India. Yes. As you can see here in this picture, during the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, non-cooperation movement. Yes. During the non-cooperation movement, mass protests became a common sight. Yes. So let us start. So here we have uh, the same thing as in the book, NCRT and uh, the, the, the same stuff is just organized in points and some key words are highlighted so uh, yes we also saw that in the um, nationalism in Europe they also developed uh, some symbols that, yes. will, that would personify the nation okay some symbols and um, uh, Germania if you remember yes yes so for for Germany so so likewise in India also they gave a face to the nation they made Bharat Mata the, 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 the painting of Bharat Mata and uh, you know the Indian flag and all those things 
so those symbols and icons and 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 uh, songs and folklore mm -hmm. and all those things they gave a sense of belonging and commonness to people yes so that they could feel that they are you know one force so how did this consciousness emerge in india the consciousness about uh, nationalism I mean. nationalism yes exactly so uh, uh, vietnam now britishers were ruling they, they 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 were colonial powers in many parts of the world like in vietnam they were here in india also so um this uh, uh connected people the, yeah. the the sentiment of anti-colonial movement that they are going to fight the colonial powers this is what brought people together okay it was a unity in the process of their struggle with colonialism yes you're getting me right yes so everyone will unite to struggle fight against colonialism what's the time 930 p.m. 920 so the sense of being oppressed under colonialism provided a shared bond that tied many different groups together maharashtra maharashtra yeah. punjab bihar uttar pradesh south so everyone they said okay we are going to struggle against the uh, with with the colonialism and we are going to fight as one so this process is going to bring people together and it will bring different groups together but this is the one thing they could unite on it yes. was a uni uni unification mm. bond right between the different right. but each class and group felt the effect of colonialism differently so if you remember in in in, in uh, uh, european uh, nationalism also different people had different expectations and aspirations from uh, this process of free freedom from dynasty rule likewise in india also the peasants the business class the politicians everyone, uh, had, different everyone had different aspirations and expectations from uh, this freedom, and freedom. yes so so they, they they had different reasons for participating in this uh, yes. movement anti colonial movement so uh, their notion of freedom were not always the same the congress under mahatma gandhi they tried to bring all the groups together yes and they tried to start a, a one movement that everyone will unite and fight against the britishers to free india from their rule but the unity did not emerge without conflict because people had different aspirations they uh, there was a conflict between them okay so we are going we are picking from 1920s and the we are going to study two main things one is the non cooperation movement and the civil disobedience movement yes. non cooperation is we are not going to cooperate with you uh, not, not going to cooperate means uh, boycotting schools, uh, British um, jobs or uh, institutions, you know, institutions right. um, telegraph, telegraph, railways, telegraph, schools, courts, um, even as far as British goods like clothes, cheap spun, like the mass production, uh, mass produced clothes uh, from Britain. So you will um, not buy like imported that. goods. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, not basically don't give the british uh any respite and do not use like so, their stuff so why would you not uh, buy imported goods because if you buy imported goods all of the money goes to the british mm. and that in turn helps them gain much more power and mm. uh, uh that that gives them a stronger hold on your country uh, because their main funding for the british people was revenue right from uh the country of india so if people are not uh, buying their uh, goods and not working in their institutions, uh, the British do not get revenue. Therefore, mm. uh, they do not have funds, and yeah. that that in turn may, and uh, and it also the other other effect of not buying imported goods is that you will end up buying uh, goods that are produced inside your country. Yeah, so you get stronger while they get weaker. Yes, yeah, so your economy will become stronger, and the people who are running business, who are your countrymen. Yeah, they will get money and they will become strong. Hmm? Yeah, got it. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, not that was non-cooperation. Now, when non-cooperation started, Britishers they started uh, you know um, arresting Indians and putting yes. them behind jails and um, beating them up brutally. 
so as as a um, to counter that uh, gandhi ji had decided that if this happens we are going to start the civil disobedience movement which is civil disobedience is means not obeying laws yes and you are uh, going to break laws break laws exactly. first of all earlier you are not going to cooperate with them you are yeah. not going to help them in administration you are not going to run their colleges you are not going to run their courts you are not going to run their telegraph and te- and railways and everything you are going to withdraw you will say okay we are not helping you because if yes. the system is not working then uh, britishers will not be able to rule and then if they if they mistreat us then we are going to actually start breaking the laws which was civil disobedience that you are going to start breaking british laws yes so let's see how this these two things happened number one is a uh, uh, non cooperation movement and the other one was a civil civil disobedience movement excellent so we will explore how congress sought to develop on the na- national movement so national movement is for swaraj how different social groups participate in the movement different groups were there muslims were there yeah. peasants were there poor people were there business class was there so how the different social groups participated in the national movement and how nationalism captured the imagination of people yeah. so here as you can see this is a picture from 1919 april 6 where people have stepped out for a mass protest uh, procession Yeah. mass procession on the streets became a common feature during the national uh, movement so so we will start with the first uh, section which is um, which talks about how the first world war uh, you know kind of kick started the uh, nationalism the national movement in india yes. and uh, khilafat and non cooperation movement right. Khilafat is basically you know the Ottoman Empire had lost in 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 World War 1 yeah definitely as yeah. a result of that they were uh, they were uh, th- there was a very harsh peace treaty that was handed to them and as a result of that the khalifa of um, the Ottoman Empire Turkey which is now uh, so he uh, had lost all the power so um, what, what that this term for that kind of So uh what happened is that uh, yes so so the muslims across the world they felt bad about it that yeah. uh, ottoman empire was a very strong muslim empire uh, islamic uh, um islamic uh, you know empire and they said that this was unfair uh, they were very harsh on him so um the khilafat movement was also you know uh, something that muslims were uh, supporting in india I see. and ah, gandhi ji wanted that uh, muslims and hindus should come together yes. uh, against the britishers yes. so the, he said that if we support the khilafat movement which uh, muslims are supporting then muslims will come along with us and yes. they will also form a big force with us in the non cooperation movement and the civil disobedience movement yes. and only one community will not be enough to uh, you know stand against the british british exactly okay so After 1919 we see the national movement spreading to new areas incorporating new social groups and developing new modes of struggle so how do we understand these developments what implications did they have so world war 1 it created a new economic and political situation economic situation why because the britishers were in the world war 1 and they needed more money to fund their um, you know war military excursions mm. yes military exc- excursions so better word so they they uh, needed uh, their, their defense expenditure went up yes of and and to fund that they increased uh, to taxes. F- the ta- the taxes and uh, they um, uh, the, this this dis- defense expenditure was financed by the war loans and increased Uh, taxes custom duties were raised and income tax introduced in india yeah. now mm, people um, had to pay more taxes for buying the goods yeah. and even for using land for farming on them they had to pay taxes to the lords yes. who were answerable to the british, british rulers government. yes so through the war years prices increased they actually doubled wow so nice. between 1913 and 1918 so nice. this led to extreme hardship of course between people yeah 
when the prices are doubled taxes are increased uh, okay so people have to pay more money and they don't have money yeah okay and on top of it because uh, britishers not only wanted more money uh, and resources they also wanted people to fight the war yeah, uh, to participate out. with them in the in the yes so the forced recruitments happened in the villages they picked people and forced them to fight uh, with them yeah. in the world war 1 which uh, caused widespread anger then in 1918 and 19 and 20 and 21 more misery was there crops failed Oof. okay as it is the taxes had increased yes crops failed okay forced recruitment so, double forced yeah. recruitment double prices yes and there was an influenza epidemic also yikes in the influenza epidemic 12 to 13 million people died that is quite the number yes that so all nice. these things were happening uh, forced recruitment taxes increased and um, crops failed and influenza okay so all these things they increased the hardships of people and um, hardships would uh, so people thought that after the war would be over all these hardships would be gone yes but this did, did, did not happen this did not because yes the aftermath of the war would have been i mean it, it's not something that goes away overnight right, right. So. so all these hardships they did not end after the world war got over and uh, um, so they decided that they have to do something about it they cannot just you know keep uh, they cannot be uh you know uh, ruled around and they cannot be exploited by they cannot keep getting exploited by the britishers so a new leader who is mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi our father of nation he appeared he came into the scene broke into the scene and he suggested a new form of struggle a new form of struggle is non violence and the power of truth satyagraha satyagraha so satya is truth and graha is power the power of truth so he f- he suggested a new mode of struggle which was satyagraha now why mahatma gandhi because mahatma gandhi had some background in this kind of a struggle yes, against the british south africa he successfully uh, protested against the apartheid because uh, you know uh, there's a story of him getting thrown out of a train because he was a colored person and he he had uh, an entire society Hmm. in south africa where uh, about all that so yeah yeah so uh, what more do you know about it i don't remember exactly hmm. but i read i think i read his biography so hmm. um the story goes that he had a uh like a, he was called to south africa i think for a conference or for education i don't remember but did he worked there as a barrister no i don't think so Uh, anyway, he was on a train and he had a VIP ticket, so he was sitting in uh, there in the train and one of the white people there uh, on the train didn't like the fact of, you know, him being uh, a colored person mm. and sitting in the privileged section of the cabin. Mm. So he complained to the guard and the guard threw him out of the train. Since then, you know, he found that very disturbing that just because of his you know he also he also saw that a lot of uh, you know indians were working in 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 very poor conditions yeah in miserable conditions in south africa mm-hmm. and he wanted to fight for them so he 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 in south africa as you uh, rightly mentioned in january 1915 uh he had come from south africa uh, yeah. he had come to india from south africa in in january 1915 uh, what had happened in south africa he had fought Uh, a racist regime the apartheid uh, yes uh, apartheid uh, with a novel method of mass agitation which was called satyagraha so here we have the picture of that indian workers in south africa marched through wakrust on november 6 1913 so here you can yeah. see when the marchers were stopped and gandhi ji arrested thousands of uh, more workers joined satyagraha against racist laws okay. and denied rights to non whites so yes. this is from south africa so the idea of satyagraha it emphasized the power of truth yes so here we will we have to understand what is really the concept of satyagraha yeah. 
is we are talking about the power of truth and need to search for truth. So it suggests that if the cause is true, it means if you are justified in what you are fighting for, if the cause is true and if the struggle was against injustice, okay, then physical force is not required. It was not yes. necessary to fight the oppressors. Without seeking vengeance, so you are not going to uh, seek vengeance or you don't even have to be aggressive. Yeah. Uh, Satyagrahi uh, could win the battle through non-violence. This could be done by appealing to the conscience of the oppressor. Okay, so you are going to be non-violent and you are going to fight for the truth and uh, you are going to appeal to the conscience of the oppressor. So people, including the oppressors, they have to be persuaded to see the truth. The oppressor is there, you have to tell them, look, my friend, what you are doing is not justified. This yeah. is not right. So, so you're basically making the oppressor feel guilty. Correct. And uh, so um, <coughs> you're not going to uh, use violence. By this struggle, truth was bound to ultimately triumph. And Mahatma Gandhi believed that this dharma of non-violence could unite all the Indians. What is dharma again? Religion. Religion. Yes, so he, he believed that this uh, religion of non-violence or this concept of uh, movement, a concept of struggle, of concept of protesting uh, um, by following Satyagraha, uh, this could unite all the Indians. I see. So after arriving in India, Mahatma Gandhi successfully organized Satyagraha movements in various places. So Champaran in Bihar. Bihar, you know, yeah. it is uh, touching the border of uh, Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh yeah. and also it touches the border of Nepal, yeah. that side, uh, under under Bihar is yeah. uh, West Bengal. So uh, he went to Bihar in 1916 to Champaran. Why? He wanted to inspire the peasants uh, to struggle against the oppressive plantation system. Yeah. So he in studied in ninth grade that... Uh, or not ninth grade, eighth grade, that in Champaran, uh, the British plantation people, mm. uh, they forced peasants to grow indigo because uh, it was a highly demanded crop and opium. Mm. Uh, so indigo is a very demanding crop. So mm. because of that, their fields would be rendered useless mm. for other crops. So there many times, like most of their farmland was just for indigo and they couldn't grow their own crops. And because of that, there were financial problems. So when Gandhiji came, a lot of, um, you know, peasants, they uh, called him to Champaran and he saw their plight and that's, that's where he first, uh, you know, again, like it says, inspired the peasants to struggle mm. against the oppressive, oppressive uh, plantation system. So that's sort of mm. the backstory for that. Good. And the next year, in 1917, he organized a Satyagraha to support the peasants of Kheda district of Gujarat. So, <clears throat> Kheda district, this, uh, this is another one, that, uh, you, you must remember these names. Yes. So, affected by crop failure and a plague epidemic, the peasants of Kheda could not pay the revenue and were demanding the revenue collection to be relaxed. I so, see. they had to pay the revenue to the uh, lords there, yeah. you know, who owned the farms, who owned the fields. So, they wanted... Uh, because because there was this uh, crop failure, yeah. uh, they, they, they did not they were not in a position to pay the taxes and the revenue to the uh, uh, field uh, to these landlords. So they said they wanted it to be relaxed and they wanted it to be cancelled, to be abolished. And then in 18, 1918 he went to Ahmedabad uh, in Gujarat to organize a satyagraha movement amongst the cotton mill workers. Yeah. Okay. So. What is Satyagraha according to Mahatma Gandhi? This is the boxes that you have in the yeah. book. So I, uh, this is just highlighted. So it is said of passive resistance, passive resistance, that it is it is not active resistance. You're yes. not like you know you're not taking up arms. Yeah. You're passive. You you you're not just towing their line. Yeah. This is passive resistance. That is a weapon of the weak. It is a weapon. Yes. It is a weapon of the weak. That is passive, but the power which is the subject of this article can can be used only by the strong okay I see. power is used by the strong passive resistance is, is used by the weak both have weapons yes. both are potent weapons yes so the power is not passive resistance power is not passive it is active resistance okay 
indeed it calls for intensive uh, intense activity power calls for in and, uh, uh, this power is not passive presence oh sorry um uh th this power is not passive uh, passive resistance and basically i think what they mean Indeed, is that for um, activity. the power the of passive resistance can only be used by the strong because passive resistance going against arms is not something for the weak hearted right right so i think that's what he's saying ki matlab you know the so yeah so he says that even though we don't have to be actively resisting uh, the uh, this thing uh, 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 we don't have to be violent we don't have to be violent and uh, it doesn't mean that you are not going to uh, do much activity so yeah. you you have to be intense in what you're doing so the movement in south africa was not passive but active yeah. the satyagraha is not physical force okay satyagraha which is uh, fighting for the truth is not physical force a satyagraha does not inflict pain on the adversary on your uh, you are not attacking and you are not inflicting yeah. pain to your uh, this thing enemy and he does not seek this destruction uh, destruction uh, so you do not seek the destruction of your enemy as such yeah. in the use of satyagraha there is no ill will whatsoever even for your enemy so satyagraha is pure soul force not physical force but soul force yeah. so truth is the very substance of the soul this is why the force is called satyagraha because it is the truth which yes. is the actual force behind the satyagraha the soul is informed with knowledge uh, in it burns the flame of love non violence is a supreme dharma yes ultimate religion non violence is the uh, it is certain that india cannot rival britain and europe why because they have arms we don't have arms or even if we do obviously they have more arms they have more arms. so so the british worship the war god we don't worship the war god yeah and they have become the bearers of arms yeah. we are not so the hundreds of millions in india can never carry arms they have made the religion of non violence their own yeah okay so uh, this is the background about sat uh, satyagraha okay yes satyagraha which means that we have started a new form of struggle we have started a new form of struggle against the britishers which is satyagraha against the background of uh, hardships that were brought about because of world war 1 and um, forced recruitment and uh, yeah. fa crop failure and prices doubling between 1913 and 1918 and extreme hardships for people and um, uh, this influenza epidemic where 13 uh, million people died so people thought that the the war is going to end these uh, uh, you know miseries but it did not happen so when it did, when it did not happen then they said we have to struggle and this struggle was led by mahatma gandhi yes. who said we are going to form a new mode of struggle which is satyagraha satyagraha which is truth where you are not you are being non violent he had a background from um, of doing this in south africa already and so he he tried to take this movement to different parts of uh, the country india in 1916 he went to champaran then 17 he went to kheda district in gujarat and 18 he went to ahmedabad cotton mills and here he explains that it is passive resistance which is the weapon of the week hmm. okay now this thing caught you know momentum yes when the roland rolet act uh, was brought so what was the rolet act Uh, emboldened with this success that the 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 the, uh, the idea of uh, satyagraha was accepted by people but yeah. a lot of people around they they started accepting this idea so gandhi ji in 1919 decided to launch a nationwide satyagraha against a proposed roulette act yeah. in 1919 so this act was passed hurriedly in imperial legislative council imperial legislative council at that time was like parliament we have parliament, now, yeah. right so imperial legislative council despite the united opposition of the indian members what was the act it said it gave the british government enormous powers what kind of powers to repress political right. activities right. any kind of satyagraha and this that the yeah. protest and and processions by gandhi ji and congress should not take place and it allowed the british government to detain political prisoners without trial for up to 2 years yes. for 2 years they will be detained they will put behind bars and there will not be any trial for them so this was obviously um, totally unjustified uh, unfair 
So again, the Imperial Legislative Council. Imperial Legislative Council had passed this act. So what was Imperial Legislative Council? It was a legislature of British India from 1861 to 18 uh, to 1947. That's when India got independence. So uh, until until India got independence, it was called Imperial Legislative Council, which was the legislature or the lawmaking you know uh, uh, body of British India, British Raj. It succeeded. It was it was succeeded by um, Council of the Governor General of India, and it was and the Council of General Governor General of India was succeeded by a Constituent Assembly of India, and after 1950, it was succeeded by the Parliament of India. Okay. Oh, one second, let me just read yeah. that again, just yeah. for clarity. So. Imperial Legislative Council, which is legislative. Yeah, of course. For, for the British India from 1861 to 1947. Okay. Succeeded, yeah. Then the Constitution, okay. All right. So basically, these are the different steps for how the... Uh, Indian Parliament. How, yeah, how the Indian Parliament was formed. Uh, mm -hmm. Originally originating the Imperial, Imperial Legislative Council from 1861 to 1947, which mm -hmm. is the first uh, disc forum for discussion on national... Uh, Le legislature. Um, legislature of yeah, it, it, it's a, it's the it's a legislature is a forum for discussion of like laws and stuff, right? So this was the British, uh, you know, sort of a forum for discussion. Then it was uh, the Council of the Governor General in India, mm -hmm. and then as we know, the Constituent Assembly of India, which was the first uh, purely Indian forum for discussion, where we obviously framed the constitution, and then what we have now, Parliament of India, which is obviously as we know the highest level. Uh, of you know legislature and everything in India, yeah. so it just shows us sort of the history of where the Parliament of India came from. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So what happened? So Rowlatt Act uh, came into being. Yes. Uh, was passed by the Imperial Legislative Council, and they said this is very unfair. So what happened? Uh, Non-violent civil disobedience. Uh, or movement. Movement. So Mahatma Gandhi wanted non-violent civil disobedience. He, he wanted that we will not follow this law, this act uh, or, or this act should not be uh, you know brought into uh, force and uh, he, he wanted uh, civil disobedience but it should not be violent yes so Mahatma Gandhi wanted non-violent civil disobedience against such unjust laws like Rowlett Act which could start uh, which would start with a hartal on April 6 1919 so a hartal started you know hartal, hartal is a, a a strike right uh, yeah har, yeah hartal where you are not uh, uh, you know doing your duties you shut yeah. down everything the shops a are strike. closed and everything yeah. so you don't uh, so administration <coughs> is not yeah there there is a hunger strike also you know, yeah where you stop eating yeah but i mean obviously this wasn't a hunger strike yeah. right? so rallies were organized in various cities workers went to strike in railway workshops, shops were closed down. Hmm. Alarmed by the popular upsurge and scared that lines of communication such as the railways and telegraph would be disrupted. Okay, so all these things. So mm, the shops were closed, railway strikes were there, and uh, lines of communication like railways and telegraph, they were all disrupted because people were not turning up for uh, this thing work. Yeah. So the British administration, they said enough is enough. They they said uh, they were we scared. Have to, we have to yeah. They they were shaken, and they they decided to clamp down on the nationalists. Mm -hmm. So local leaders were picked up. They were put behind bars. Uh, from Amritsar and Mahatma Gandhi was barred from entering Delhi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is happening. Sixth uh, the hartal happened on sixth April nineteen nineteen. Four days later. On 10th of April, the police in Amritsar fired upon a peaceful procession, provoking widespread uh, attacks on banks, post offices, and railway stations. So what happened? Martial law was imposed, and General uh, <coughs> Reginald Dyer, he took command. took command. So because martial law was uh, imposed, which means that shoot at sight or orders are there, yeah. If anyone steps out for any procession or any protest, he will People be shot. People are not allowed to gather in places. Right. 
So this is this is uh, General Dyer. Okay, and uh, so after that, on 10th April, this thing happened, right? Yes. Um, uh, processions, uh, police fired on a peaceful procession when people were attacking banks and post office and all. And then 13th April, uh, three days later, this infamous Jallianwala Bagh massacre happened. So this incident took place. What happened was that people from there was a there was a fair in 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 uh, yeah. yes uh, they, they in Amritsar. There was a fair in Amritsar, and people did not know that there was a marshal because people from around the um, places, you know, villages around Amritsar, they had come to attend the fair. Yeah. So they gathered in an enclosed ground of Jallianwala Bagh. They did not know that there was a martial law um, yeah. in place. So being from outside the city, they were unaware of the martial law that had been imposed. So Dyer entered the area because he had he had been you know deployed there. Uh, he he was in charge in this area. Uh, he wanted to act and he wanted to send out a, a message. message to the rest of India. Yes. So he blocked the exit point and opened fire on the crowd, killing hundreds. Actually, uh, 379 people died in that. Oh, wow. Almost 400 people died in that. That is intense. Yes. His object, as he declared later, was to produce a moral effect, to create in the minds of Satyagrahis a feeling of terror and awe. How would they be of awe? Why would they be of awe? They'd be scared, but... Mm. Yeah, like oh, it like, inspires even, like even in Iraq when George W. Bush um, attacked <coughs> Iraq, uh, you know, in uh, so that that was um, called Operation Shock and Awe. Yeah. So the, the, this book by Nigel Collett was written. It called uh, it's titled The Butcher of Amritsar. Okay, General Ronald uh, Reginald Dyer. Reginald Dyer. So. This was a Jalia Balabagh thing. Now, the the upheaval. Uh, I mean, because almost 400 people were killed in this uh, Jalia Balabagh mm -hmm. incident, people got very angry. Indians got very angry, and as the news about Jalia Balabagh massacre spread, crowds took to the streets in many North Indian towns, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, there were strikes, clashes with police, and attacks on government buildings. Okay, the government responded with brutal repression, seeking to humiliate and terrorize people. So Satyagrahis, so there was this, General Dyer had issued a crawling order, crawling mm -hmm. order. So what was the crawling order? The Satyagrahis, you know, the freedom fighters, they were forced to rub their noses on the ground, crawl on the street and do salam or salute to all the sahibs, the, 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 officers of the yeah. British and and they were flogged and the villages around Gujranwala Punjab which is now uh, in Punjab which is now in Pakistan Gujranwala the, these uh, villages were bombed and because you see this is this is a yeah. picture of the crawling orders uh, uh, issued by General Dyer okay in Amritsar uh, after the you know the the protests were happening people were um, attacking the government buildings and all. So uh, because of so much of violence, Gandhiji said, okay, this is not Satyagra. The uh, Satyagra was supposed to be non-violent. Non a lot of violence is happening from both the sides. So he called off the movement for the first time, which was in 1919. Yes. Okay. Now, Roll It Satyagra. Uh, Roll It Satyagra had been a widespread movement. It was still limited mostly to cities and towns, and Mahatma Gandhi now felt that the need to launch a more broad-based movement in India. So he said that only Hindus are not enough, even Muslims should be roped in. So one way of doing this was to take up the Khilafat issue. What was the Khilafat issue? The First World War had ended with the defeat of Ottoman Turkey. And there were rumors that a harsh peace treaty was going to be imposed on the Ottoman Empire. The spiritual head of Islamic world, the Khalifa, to defend the Khalifa's uh, temporal uh, powers. Temporal powers are the powers that the Pope has, usually, you know, on administrative issues. One yes. is the religious issues, and then there are administrative issues, how the country will run. 
So the temporal powers of Khalifa, uh, to, to, to defend his uh, powers, the Khalifa, uh, Khilafat, uh, uh, Khilafat, Khalifa, Khilafat, Khilafat uh, Committee was formed in uh, Mumbai, in Bombay, in March 1919. So Khilafat is also Urdu for opposition. Yes. Khilafat karna kisi ki, ki, kisi ki khilafat karna yani you are opposing. Yes. So uh, you are opposing the um, British Raj. Uh, so Khilafat Committee was formed in Bombay in March 1919, the same year as Satyagraha uh, yeah. had been called off. 1919 was. Yeah. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Hmm. So I, I I was just looking for when was the Satyagraha started, which was in uh, 15 when he start when he came to India, and 1916 the uh, Mahatma Gandhi came to India in 1915. 1916. 1916 uh, he started the Satyagraha movement in, 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 in Champaran. Yes. So where are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so right here. No, yeah, no, no. Right no, no. Okay, okay. Go down. Mm. <laughs> so, so Khilafat movement. So uh, there were two brothers, uh, the uh, a young generation of Muslim leaders like the brothers Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. They uh, began to discuss uh, this issue with Mahatma Gandhi, how uh, they can join the non-cooperation movement uh, uh, and uh, how uh, Khilafat movement uh, issue can become a part of the non-cooperation movement. Yeah. Okay, so um, they they uh, united mass action on the issue. They wanted that a mass action should a united mass action should happen. Okay, this um, this uh, Gandhiji saw this as an opportunity to bring Muslims under the umbrella of a unified national movement. Yes. Now at an at a Calcutta session of the Congress in September 20, which is the next year. Um, you see, uh, the, 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 the Satyagraha is called off in yes. 1919. Yes. And after that, he thinks that let us make it a countrywide uh, movement. Yeah. So next year in 1920, in Calcutta session um, of uh, Congress, uh, he, convened, um, he convinced other leaders of the need to start the non-cooperation movement in support of the Khilafat as well as for Suraj, which self is self-governance, self yes. So why non-cooperation? Why did we start non-cooperation? So here you can see a procession and this is a charkha. Yeah. This is a charkha which is a symbol of uh, nationalism also because you, you can make khadi. Uh, Gandhiji used to make cotton, from, uh, yeah. those, those things. Uh, you, you, uh, you can weave cotton on this. And um, this charkha uh, was a national symbol yeah. of uh, you know self-reliance. This was the only thing that any everyone could afford. It was uh, not it did not require electricity and could be made at home. So these people are taking that out. So foreign cloth, the boycott of foreign cloth in July 1922. The foreign cloth was seen as a symbol of Western economic and cultural dom domin domination. So in 1909, Gandhiji had written a book, Hind Swaraj, self-government. His book was Hind Swaraj, self-government, 1909. So Mahatma Gandhi declared that British rule was established in India with the cooperation of Indians. If India wouldn't cooperate, Britishers would not have been able to do it. Yeah. And, and they, they are surviving or they are able to continue the rule because Indians are continuing to cooperate with them. Yes. And he said that if Indians refuse to cooperate, British rules will, uh, British Raj will collapse in India, and the self-government uh, or the Swaraj will come uh, into being. Into being. So how could non-cooperation become a movement? So Gandhiji proposed that the government uh, should unfold in st uh, that the movement, uh, the non-cooperation movement, should be in stages. Are you getting it? Non-cooperation movement should be in stages. Uh, so first of all, we will surrender surrender the titles, the titles that are given by the British uh, Inspector General. This that. Um, so the titles we will will or judges and these things. Uh, 
um, the su uh, surrender the titles that the government awarded and the boycott of civil services. Yeah. Uh, army, army, police, courts. police, courts, legislative, uh, legislative councils, civil services or railways, telegraph, yeah. legislative councils, schools and foreign goods. So we are all going to boycott all this. Then in case the government uh, uses uh, repression, then we are going to go for civil disobedience campaign which means that we are going to break the laws. We're not going to obey the government. Hmm. Uh, and also break the laws because well, so salt uh, march where they <laughs> went and yeah. uh, made salt was against the law. So not through the summer... The government is breaking laws, right? Yeah. So through the summer of 1920, Mahatma Gandhi and Shaukat Ali toured extensively. Shaukat Ali from? The um, Khilafat movement. Khilafat movement. Yes. Where, but his brother didn't... Uh, mm -hmm. This guy was more close. Yeah, he imposed the uh, emancipation. So through the summer, of, uh, they, 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 Shaukat Ali and Mahatma Gandhi, they, they toured extensively, mobilizing people for about the non-cooperation movement, telling them what it is yeah. and what they have to do. They have to be non-violent. So many uh, within the Congress were not convinced that they, 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 yeah. uh, they were concerned about the proposal because they, uh, they were reluctant to boycott the council elections which was scheduled in November 1920. Yes. Okay. So in 1920, Mahatma Gandhi and Shaukat Ali were touring India extensively yeah. Yeah. to spread the idea of uh, non-cooperation. But they said, if we are going for non-cooperation, we will not be able to participate in the council elections, which yes. were happening in November, November 1920. 19, and they feared that the movement might lead to popular violence. Uh, in, the, in the months between September and December in 1920, there was an intense tussle within the Congress because some people were saying we should go yes. with the non-cooperation movement. Some people were there was disagreement. For a while, there seemed to be no meeting point between the supporters and opponents of the non-cooperation movement. And finally, Congress session at Nagpur in December 1920, uh, they reached a compromise, and the non-cooperation program was adopted. Okay. Okay. Right. No, it's been around 40 minutes. We, we, yeah, yeah, we'll just finish this uh, bit all, or with this part also. And then. Okay, so differing uh, strands within the movement. So, what it, how people saw, how different people saw the movement. The, the non cooperation Khilafat movement, see, now it is the Khilafat issue is joined with this. So non-cooperation Khilafat movement began in January 1921. <coughs> December 20, they had uh, the Congress had adopted, and yeah. in next month, January 21, <coughs> the Khilafat movement, non-cooperation Khilafat movement began. So various social groups participated in the movement, each with its own specific aspirations. All of them responded to the call of Swaraj, which is self-government. Everyone said, "Okay, yes, Swaraj is what we want." But the term meant different things to different people. The non-cooperation movement in the towns. So in the towns, there was the middle class. Yeah. Hmm? Are you able to concentrate? Yeah. Okay. The movement started with the middle class. They were in the towns. And thousands of students, they left government-controlled schools and colleges because non-cooperation. Yeah. Not civil disobedience. Not they just Just non-cooperation. They left uh, government-controlled schools and colleges. Headmasters and teachers resigned. Hmm? Yeah. Lawyers gave up their legal practices. So the council elections were uh, boycotted in most provinces, except Madras. I see. Now, why Madras? Because uh, we'll just know, uh, find out. Madras, where the Justice Party, the party of the non-Brahmins. Brahmin was the upper class. Yes. Non-Brahmins were the lower class. They felt that ent entering the council was on the only way of gaining some power. They said, if we don't participate in elections and don't get into power, we will be suppressed. You know, we'll remain yeah, suppressed. We won't be represented properly. Yeah, something that usually only Brahmins had access to. Yeah. So, so the lower castes basically wanted power. Yes, and they wanted they to get, get elected and come into the council. Yeah. The effect of non-cooperation on the uh, on the economic front economic firm because they were not buying any foreign goods what happened foreign goods were boycotted liquor shops were picketed picketed means they are uh, surrounded you know picket fences 
they were fenced, p- picketed. Um, is a form of demonstration or protest by which people block the entrance to a shop, factory or office. So no one can enter the shop. So it was picketed. And foreign cloth, they were burning it and they were making a bonfire out of it. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Kind of aggressive, mm-hmm. but okay. Yeah, the import of foreign cloth halved between 1921 and 22. So b- before, before, uh, before 21, the revenue that they were uh, generating was 102 crore rupees. Wow. It dropped down to 57 crore rupees. Big blow. Wow. Big blow. Very big blow. That's a 50, almost a 50% decrease. Right. So a big blow to the British uh, economy and British Raj. Yeah. So in many places, merchants and traders refused to trade in foreign goods. Now, why merchants and traders? Because, you know, uh, when 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 the fu- when the first world war happened, after it stopped, a lot of, uh, and people started they needed uh, goods. So all these merchants they they benefited from it, mm. right? From from the shortage of supply of goods across the world. So so but if if the Indian businessmen are seeing that people are buying foreign goods and they they cannot benefit from it, yeah. so they also jumped into the movement. Um, the traders refuse to trade in foreign goods or finance foreign trade, right? Um, a- as the boycott movement spread, the people began discarding imported cloths. Okay, and um, but what happened was the cl- uh, uh, khadi was very expensive because obviously because the raw material needed, you know. Yeah, because it was not mass produced. But the foreign goods they were mass produced in 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 uh, Britain, so the. Poor people could not afford khadi, so then they they could um, they they could not uh, uh, you know boycott, boycott the mil- uh, milk cloth which was uh, from the British Raj for too long, or from the factories uh, they were in 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 India. So similarly, the boycott uh, the boycott of British institutions was also not very uh, successful. successful. So what happened? Uh, or why? Because uh, we needed colleges, the institutions, Indian they institutions were not in place. Yeah, institutions. Yes. Where, where, where would all the teachers and students go once they're out? They yes. needed Indian institutions. They still needed education. Right. So because of that, yeah. So they started trickling back to the government schools and lawyers joined they back to the to government go? courts. Yes. Now, rebellion in the countryside. So we'll see in the country this was in the uh, this was in the city right in the towns in yes. the cities where the bi- middle class was there the business class was there now we'll see what is happening in the countryside hmm? well, if you are tired then a little bit uh, yeah i think we'll end here and then we can continue okay. about the countryside later all right so We'll see the rest of it, inshallah, in the next uh, part.